Uh, welcome everyone into uh, who is watching, uh, who's joined us here on Zoom or is watching on Facebook Live. I am Lonnie Goldsmith. I'm the editor of TC Jew Folk and the moderator for tonight's lively Jewish discussion. Lively Jewish discussion. Show, the good, place. Uh, show the good Place. We are joined by our panelists tonight, uh, Rabbi Sim Glazer from Temple Israel, Gitti Fredman, the community connector from the Minneapolis Jewish Federation, and Rabbi Alexander Davis from Bethel Synagogue. Everyone, uh, welcome to the three of you. Thank you for uh, joining this. And Gitti, thank you for uh, help putting this together. It was great when we found that you were so enthusiastic about this. It's a terrific show. Uh, I really enjoyed it. I'm starting my second watch of it this time with my children, um, 15 and 11. It's great for the 15 year old. Um, there's a lot I forgot um, that maybe not so 11 year old appropriate and sort of cringing our way through some of it and hope she doesn't ask questions and it goes right over her head. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so the good place for, you know, I'm hoping that everybody here has seen it, um, but by way of quick introduction, uh, it was a four season show that I think ended absolutely perfectly um, as far as TV sitcoms go. Uh, it aired on NBC, it just wrapped up earlier this year, I think January or February, um, but it was really a terrific, uh, TV show. Um, so we got some clips, we have some questions, we're going to have some discussions, some banter. Uh, we would love to get your questions for those of you who are watching us either on Zoom or on Facebook. So um, please enter your questions in the group chat uh, and I will read them out. Um, I can give you give your name or read them anonymously if you'd prefer, either way. Um, and uh, we will get rolling. We're going to uh, we go sort of in order um, of the episode with the clips um, that we're going to show, uh, but we're going to start uh, fairly uh, early in season one. So I'll let uh, my coworker Genevieve fire up the uh, the first clip, and we will uh, we'll get to my question after that. So maybe my biggest question: Am I? I mean, is this? Or, well, it's not the heaven or hell idea that you were raised on. But generally speaking, in the afterlife, there's a good place and there's a bad place. You're in the good place. You're okay, Eleanor. You're in the good place. Well, that's good. Sure is. <laughs> okay, let's take a walk, shall we? Oh. Did I have a purse? No, I'm dead. Right. Okay. So right, right off the bat, I, I had always been sort of raised on the idea that in Judaism, we didn't believe in a heaven or a hell, and it was just alive or, well, not alive. And so, uh, did did I, I'm not going to say I was raised wrong, but are there, you know, a heaven or hell concepts in Judaism that maybe I didn't know about? Uh, get to you. Let's start with you. Lonnie, do I have to be first? Well, I, I was being chivalrous, but we could start with one of the rabbis if you'd prefer. Yeah, let's All do All right, that. Rabbi Davis. I'll throw the question to you instead. Great. First of all, let me just say thank you so much uh, to Gitti, to Federation, to TC Jew folk for uh, having me and creating this opportunity for us uh, to be together. I think about uh, a good place and um, with everything going on in the world, this is actually a pretty good place to be uh, right now with all of us uh, together. We get to watch some TV together get to have a share a few laughs, share a little bit of uh, learning. And the truth is, it's not uh, all that common, unfortunately, um, to bring the cross section of the community uh, mm -hmm. together, like, uh, uh, like we have been um, via Zoom in, in recent weeks and, uh, and tonight and um, in, in, uh, across denominations and across uh, different parts of our community. So thank you all for the opportunity to be here and to share with you. Um, in terms of Lonnie's uh, question, um, 
I think it's true that uh, um, we tend not to focus, uh, I would say, heavily on um, the concepts of heaven and hell. There may be concepts, but I would use that plural um, specifically, concepts, because um, the truth is that in our some two, 3,000 year history, it's not like there's only been one concept of the afterlife, the world to come. You know, every, every era, every, uh, every millennia has had a, a slightly different concept. So concepts of uh, heaven and hell, although at the same time, I think um, the reason why you know, it might have struck you, struck you as uh, foreign is because it tends not to be our focus. We tend to focus on living in this world, um, living in the here and now. This is the, uh, the day that God has made. Let's rejoice in it. Let's live in this day uh, fully. We're not living for um, uh, the world to come. Uh, Rabbi Glazer. Uh, what, yeah. are, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you know, um, uh, uh, Rabbi David said it said it quite what quite well. You know, you're not gonna you're not gonna be used to going into a shul and hearing a rabbi give what 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 are called uh, fire and brimstone. You're going to rot in hell. You're gonna burn in hell, or you're gonna bask in the glories of heaven. You don't hear us talking that much about that. Um, largely, I think, because uh, as Rabbi David said, the work we need to do on ourselves is in the here here and now. And the whole idea of relying on heavenly reward or eternal damnation is actually rather selfish in the Jewish light, because we live in a world of real people and human interaction. And if all you're doing is attempting to get to the good place by being good, that's all about you. And if you're trying to avoid the bad place by, by not sinning, again, it's, 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 it's all about you. Um, this series hints at, at, at this in that while the bad place doesn't seem bad, it's really not about the setting as we find out, you know, when we watch several episodes, um, but it's about the self-absorbed nature of the inhabitants that are making their heaven and hell wherever they are. Uh, I'm getting a little a ahead of it. Um, but the only other thing I would say about heaven and hell generally is a, a Jewish view is that you know we believe in a god who's a god of justice and fairness and if a person lives a life of good deeds uh and does the right thing and and shomer meets vote you know does does what the torah says but suffers their entire life the god of justice should reward them with something in the afterlife that that makes sense you know they should be rewarded and conversely if somebody is a terrible person but lives a life of only riches and splendor there should be some comeuppance in the world to come. So there is a rabbinic view of that kind of, uh, but, but again, as Rabbi David said, we don't talk about that very much because really the work we need to do is in this place here and now. Gitty, back to you. You feeling ready? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So when I teach or share how I was brought up and what, what my view is, um, it most, a lot of it is based on Maimonides' 13 principles of faith. And so when I was watching this show, I couldn't, I was just struck how many concepts that came up in the show were part of the, the 13 principles of faith. This one, this question I think is um, number 11, I believe, that we believe, I, I'll say it in Hebrew and then I'll say it in English, if that's okay with everybody. Absolutely. I believe with complete faith, that the creator, blessed be his name, Gomel Tov pays back good to the people who keep the mitzvot, and there is a there are repercussions, over mitzvotav. So piggybacking off of what Rabbi Glazer was saying is that here, in the here and now of this world, we don't always see the justice. And that is one of the things that teaches us that there, that there is something after this life as we know it here and now. So, you know, I was 
And everything that I'm sharing is also just what I know so far, because these are very deep and esoteric concepts. And I just know like a tiny little tip of the iceberg. So, um, so back to the actual question, what is the Jewish, as Lonnie phrased it, are heaven and hell and the afterlife Jewish concepts. So from how I understand it, they're very Jewish concepts. And in concurrence with Rabbi Davis and Rabbi Glazer, with the Rabbi Davis's emphasis was that we are focused on the here and now. And that's why, like both of them said, we, we don't put such an emphasis on this, but it is one of the pillars of Jewish faith. And like Michael, how Michael says to Eleanor, it's not the two places, it's not this heaven and hell that they were brought up on. From how I understand it, it's not so much a place, but more of an experience. So it's this, we're right now, we're this combination of body and soul. And then after we pass on, after 120 years, there is this less of a place, but more of an experience. And the quality of that experience is based on different re relationships and how we've cultivated those relationships in this world. We could leave it at that for now because so many, our next questions are gonna touch upon other, other um, parts of this question. Excellent, all right, well, the, oh, Rabbi Davis oh, is raising sorry, his Rabbi hand. Davis, go ahead. Sure, just, just before we go on to another question, if I can just chime in. Um, uh, Giti, I'm a big fan of the, the Rambam, Maimonides. We, we sing those words that you quoted uh, at the conclusion of services every Friday night. Oh, yeah. Um, can you sing it, Rabbi Davis? Can I sing it? Oh, it's, yeah. Rabbi Davis is really the, uh, the song uh, leader of the of the <laughs> but, um, but what I was thinking is that... Um, just to uh, kind of put it in, in context, um, it's true that, uh, you know, Rambam presents these 13 principles, like the major ideas in, in Judaism, but it, it also has to be uh, pointed out that Rambam is kind of, he's one opinion. And we know that in his day, um, his work was routinely criticized. Um, and, you know, we could compare Rambam's take on resurrection uh, bodily resurrection or lack thereof with Ron Ban, his contemporary, and they come to different uh, conclusions. And one of the things that I find um, really compelling about Judaism is that there's tremendous breadth given to, um, uh, to various ideas, especially about something that, you know, we'll know when we get there, <laughs> if we get there. Um, but on the other hand, uh, a, a de-emphasis on creed and a greater emphasis on deed. So we have to act in this world. We have to do the mitzvot, uh, as Rabbi Glazer said. Um, but whether you believe, you know, with Ramban or whether you believe with Rambam, uh, we're all part of the same big uh, tent, the same uh, people. And um, we can kind of leave this question uh, ultimately until the Mashiach comes and, and we find out. All right, uh, Rabbi Glazer, did you want to do some singing for us, or are we good? No, nah, that's all right. I'll pass on that. <laughs> that's about right, my well, pay grade on this gig. All right, that's fair. That's fair. Sorry. We'll we'll uh, we'll figure out uh, we'll, we'll figure out how to compensate you the next time we uh, Great. we come to this, right? Uh, all right, so we'll, uh, oh, so before um, we go to the next clip, I wanted to give a heads up. We're having, uh, we've had some Facebook uh, and Zoom issues uh, in terms of the integration between the two and sharing the Zoom uh, on Facebook as well at the same time. So unfortunately we are not, uh, we are not on Facebook at the moment. Um, so we are going to, um, we will post the video once we're complete in uh, on the TCG Folk Facebook page and you can share it from there afterwards. But unfortunately, uh, just the people here are gonna be watching it. So uh, we will, um, hopefully we'll, we'll get it out to more people uh, when the event is over with. Um, 
All right, so clip two. Uh, oh, and one other note before we go to the clip. I did get a note from somebody that they are not fully through the show. Um, we will, I will give the heads up. Uh, we only have one clip that is from season four, which is not streaming yet on Facebook. That's coming, I believe, sometime in the late summer, early fall. So I will give that a heads up. And if people would like to mute, close the computer, walk away for a few minutes while that clip is up or while we we're discussing it, um, I have it set up as the fifth of the six clips that we're going to show. Uh, time permitting, of course, you can tune out and come back. Um, we're trying to uh, prevent spoilers as much as possible. Um, so um, uh, we go to the next clip, which is from the sixth episode of season one. Uh, Genevieve can pull that out for us. No. Quick summary of contractualism. Uh, imagine a group of reasonable people are coming up with the rules for a new society. Like if your Uber driver talks to you, the ride should be free? Sure, but anyone can veto any rule that they think is unfair. So if you said we should be able to break our promises without any repercussions, someone would veto that rule. Well, my first rule would be that no one can veto my rules. Well, that's called tyranny and it's generally frowned upon. Was that it? That was it. Okay, good. So that, I, I really, it's funny for a lot of reasons, especially the, you know, Uber ride and not wanting to talk to your driver. But in a society, you know, we talk about the idea of, um, they, they sort of talk about the laying out the rules of a society. Um, and I know there are, I, I'm almost certain there are um, plenty of places in, in, in the Torah that is far outside of my knowledge base where that, uh, where that gets discussed. How does that play out in Judaism, both uh, in the Talmudic times and more modern times? Rabbi Davis. I'm sorry, I kind of lost you there. You cut out just a little bit. Can you say it one more time? Yeah, the the so what they were discussing about the clip was the um, sort of how you know rules in a modern society in terms of the um, you know what is tyranny as you know Eleanor tried to you know veto everybody else's rules, but what um, you know how does the idea of you know how a society comes together um, is there Jewish guidance for how you know, from either the Talmudic times or how something, how it sort of plays out more in modern times, how the, uh, how sort of society and the rules about it, uh, how it's governed sort of form. Sure. So, um, uh, you know, I started watching the, the show with, uh, I think my then 11 year old, as you said, Lonnie, earlier, and um, thought that uh, it was just a little bit above kind of where he needed to be at the time. And so I, I stopped watching it with him originally. Uh, now he's a couple of years later. And, and um, you know, as I've come to understand and, and really learn about um, all of the deep thinking, the philosophy behind, um, you know, the, the ideas here, um, it's really uh, remarkable how um, sophisticated and brilliantly they've woven in um, issues of uh, philosophy into uh, otherwise hysterical um, show. So you ask if Judaism has um, kind of, I guess, a similar construct um, about rules that govern society, for sure. I mean, uh, Judaism is, uh, you know, full of, what do we say, 613 mitzvot. And of those, according to tradition, um, they can be divided uh, in a variety of ways, but one of the most common is mitzvot ben adam lechavero, mitzvot ben adam lemakom, mitzvot that govern our relationship with God, and mitzvot that govern our relationship with other people. In fact, at the end, uh, those two overlap. Um, but so many of uh, you know the common um, commandments that we think about are those commandments that speak to how we interact with um, with those uh, in our world. Uh, Honor your mother and father, and love the stranger, and give tzedakah, and lift up those who have fallen. Um, 
you know, in a sense, uh, the question, um, am I my brother's keeper? From the very beginning of the Torah, Torah the story of uh, Cain and Abel, that really is the question uh, of the Torah. And the Torah spends um, all five books answering, a duh, yes, you are your brother's keeper, and let me show you how. Here's the pathway. You know, the word halacha, um, too narrowly translated as Jewish law, really means the way. This is the way we create um, a society of uh, justice and of chesed and of shalom of peace. Well, now, part of that clip, and I really like that, and part of the clip that we didn't show there was um, Chidi holding the book to Eleanor, which became sort of a central point throughout. And I think that very much the theme throughout is, what do we owe each other? And I think what you said, Rabbi, speaks a lot of, to that. And I think that there is... Um, and I think that that theme plays out through all four seasons of the show is the, what do we owe each other? And I very much think that, you know, what you said ties into central tenets of Judaism and, uh, and how we, how we act towards each other and what we, what we give of and what we, you know, what we should expect of others. Um, Gitti, how about you on this, uh, on this clip? Yeah, like Rabbi Davis said, you know, we can sort the mitzvot out many different ways. And what jumped out at me as Eleanor was having her transformation, because she really transforms as the show goes on. She, she really transforms. And, you know, the Ten Commandments are divided up and into the interpersonal relationship and the, between man and God are humans and God and between humans and fellow humans. And it's fascinating to me because a lot of times I'm interacting with people and they get a lot more upset when people are maybe shirking their responsibilities to each other versus shirking their responsibilities or the maybe neglecting a mitzvah or commandment that's between humans and God. And I don't know if this will resonate for you, but this resonates for me, this um, physical parable to a spiritual concept. Um, I like to call it best body at 40. So if, if I were to, after this quarantine, if I were to go to Lifetime and Lifetime Fitness or any gym and get a coach and say, I want my best body at 40, I'm gonna have this big birthday coming up soon. They would probably put me on a regimen which would have two big parts. There would be the diet, what I put into my body, and exercise. And if I would say to the coach, you know, I really want my best body at 40, but I'm not willing to give up chocolate. They would probably say to me, okay, we can do our best training you, but if you don't give up all that chocolate you're eating, we're not going to be able to help you get your best body at 40. And if I said the inverse, if I said, I will be meticulous about what I eat, but I can't carve out time to come in and work out, they would probably say, okay, but then you're not going to have your best body at 40. It's a, it's, it's a combination of both of those elements. And I like to use that parable for our best soul health. We have a soul that was imbued into us by God. God breathed it into us. And now our, the regimen or the, the training for our best soul health is are the mitzvot that are between humans and God and the mitzvot that are the interpersonal. And so... I guess, and I think these are the words of the Gemara. I think it, it refers to them as ha beha talia. They are, they are intertwined and interwoven. And so if we see people putting too much emphasis on one arena or the other, that's probably not what God had in mind. We're supposed to be this synergistic, beautiful, harmonious combination of these two arenas for our best soul health. 
Rabbi Glazer, what do you think about that and getting your best soul health? Well, you know, um, I was I was struck by this this question, um, and it led me to start thinking a little bit about what's going on right now in the world. Um, you know, there's a, there's a rabbinic uh, dictum, "B'makom uh, she'en uh, anashim tishtadeli yoish." You know, in a place where there are no menches, mm -hmm. strive to be a mensch, right? In a place where people aren't standing up for what they need to be standing up for, you got to take it on. And without wanting to be too much of a scene spoiler, later on, I think it's in the first series, in the first uh, um, season, um, they actually make a, they, 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 they make a, a, a point about um, how they're, they've all been placed in that place, not necessarily for their own selves, but to interact with other people. In other words, the worst possible person will be linked up with them in order to transform their personality because i think i think what if this program taught me anything it's that the souls in the in the program are working stuff out with each other they're you know that's what's going on the whole time they're all guilty they're all sinful they've all done different things and they're all pitted together really as a way of 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 discovering things about themselves and i think again i think it's an interesting time in our own lives where I know, I don't know about the rest of you, we were talking about this earlier. I get up in the morning and I just freak out about the news. I listen to the news and I read it and I go, oh my God, what's, what's happening with the world? And then as I go through the day and greet people, albeit from a distance, and, you know, and interact with other souls, even if it's over uh, on screen time, I, I, I sense that, that, that we need other people um, to show us how to behave. Um, there's a lot of blame game going on in the series of in, in, in The Good Place, but ultimately everybody has a role to play in the show. They have a role to play in the drama, and that's really how it is with us in real life. Um, as the characters develop, and somebody just mentioned this, through the theory, uh, series, it's my impression they become less selfish. In the beginning, they really are all about themselves and, their, and the stuff they're trying to do and the way they died and the way they lived their lives but they become more and more prone to assisting one another as the seasons go by. There's a, and lastly, I'll just say that it's also interesting, the end of, of um, uh, season one, episode six, I think it is, um, uh, Michael acknowledges that the problem lies somewhere and he's about, everybody thinks he's about to point to Eleanor, but he says he points to himself. And when I thought, I thought that was really beautiful because it reminded me of a very important Kabbalistic, um, um, Lurianic Kabbalistic notion that the universe is broken and that it is in fact Hashem, the Ein Sof, that has broken the universe and made a, a mess of things in order that we can spend our lives on this earth and then by extension our soul's lives in the afterlife to try to remedy the situation, to try to rebuild and repair a broken world of, of, of Kaleem that, um, that are broken up, in a sense, by doing tikkun. And what's the best way to learn how to do tikkun? It's to get to know each other and find out your faults and find out how you can improve your behavior with other people. So that's what I think we owe each other, the opportunity to do good things. Absolutely. And I think, uh, Rabbi Glazer, you mentioned the idea that, I, I think it was you that, who said that it related, you, you could relate to it how, um, uh, to what's going on today. And I think sort of the idea, of, you know, back to my original question of what do we owe each other right now, we owe it to stay inside, to be safe, to be away from other people, um, to wear masks when we go out, to social, be socially distant at this point that I think is right now what we owe each other. And I think there's a way to sort of take that concept uh, and really spin it to any time. Yeah, but I think it goes beyond just social distancing as something we owe people. Somebody on the news, I think it was tonight, um, suggested that, that, that um, some, of the best, some of the best things we can do for other people during this per particular crisis is to... Um, is to a be positive about 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 things, mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and um, what was I going to say? Also to, um, it'll come back to me. Um, that we need to, we need to be, we need to, to feel, we need to feel positive. We need to give a good, um, uh, uh, put on a good face. Um, yeah, it'll come back to me. I can oh. just, uh, yeah, Robert Davis. Chime in. Um, this very notion, what we owe each other, feels to me to be a, a very Jewish concept. Uh, we say, you know, we quote Hillel all the time in, in Einani Limili, if I'm only for myself, uh, what am I? Um, and in, in that sense, it feels like, you know, there are uh, some classic kind of Jewish ideas that come through uh, in this thread throughout uh, the show. You know, when I meet with uh, B'nai Mitzvah students, um, I talk about what does it mean to become a, a bat mitzvah? What is that really all about? And sometimes, you know, one will say, well, I get to wear my talis or I get to read from the Torah. And I say, it's true, but, you know, massage that language a little bit. It's not that you get to, actually it's that you have a responsibility to. And often we'll compare um, what does it mean to become an adult as a, a young adult, as a kid growing up in America, we think about uh, these markers in time. Well, I, you know, I can get my driver's license or I, I have the right to vote, right? But Judaism is focused much less on our rights and much more on our responsibility. The whole notion behind mitzvah is the idea of chiyuv, is the idea of obligation. That is to say that we are born, and this sounds um, kind of harsh, but we're born in debt. Right? God has given us life, God has given us this world, and um, we are uh, you know, asked to, uh, to kind of pay it back, essentially. When we, when we eat an apple, usually we think about saying a bracha on an apple as a thank you. It's really not a thank you. A bracha is really more of a may I please. Right? The apple belongs to God. Right? We take the apple and we say, may I please have this apple? That's what we do when we say the, uh, the bracha. And it connects to this idea of uh, um, we are indebted to God. We owe uh, each other something because Judaism is so much focused on um, responsibility that we have. We quote it all the time. We're responsible for each other. One question that uh, that popped in, I wanted to uh, before we got too far away from the first question, was asked. Um, you know, talking about the uh, sort of if Jews don't believe in heaven, is the somebody had asked, how is Jacob, the angels, and the ladder explained if um, if heaven is not necessarily a Jewish concept? We'll leave it to one. Well, I could. Three of you I, wanna, I could take Sam, a stab at it. I could take a stab at it. I've you know been studying Kabbalah, Jewish mysticism for several years now, and and what I'm always taken with. I was going to speak more about this about uh, in regards to one of the later questions, but but that when you look at the uh, when you look at something like Jacob's dream and the angels, when you look at the whole concept of angels, you know, uh, our our Christian brothers and sisters are are more likely to think of angels as actual beings with their own. Um, their own effective personalities and agency, but but the Kabbalah looks at a angels as, and not only Kabbalah, looks at angels as malachim. We call them malachim, that being messengers, right? That they don't have agency in and of themselves. They just carry the message of either goodness or evil from individuals to each other and up through the heavens. So when an angel is ascending and descending, when the angels are ascending and descending, on the ladder, what they're doing is they're taking Jacob's hopes and aspirations and dreams, bringing him to heaven, and only then, because as Kabbalah says, what what uh, what is aroused arousal below leads to arousal above. As the angels reach heaven, all they are are messengers bringing Jacob's hopes and and dreams, and only then does God respond by again initiating um, uh, uh, angels to come down. So heaven, it's not so much about heaven being a place up there. It's directional, but it's not. Thank you. And that was from Lynn and Jan Kennan. Uh, Chaya had a question that, uh, Rabbi Glazer, I think goes to something that you had 
mentioned and wanted to before we before we go to the next clip was um, Michael was about to take responsibility. It was actually at the end of this episode. And, you know, he was about to say that it was my fault. It was, I, I'm the one who made the mistakes. All these bad things happened because of me. Mm. Does the idea of him taking responsibility change when we learn what his actual motivations were at the end of the first season? Um, I don't know if I can answer that really. I was thinking more of, of Michael in, in terms of, of somebody who, who has, who has initiated a broken world in order for the people that live there to repair themselves and get to a ne next stage, the next stage of the soul, which we're going to go into later. Um, I All don't right, know if cool. somebody else wants to tackle that. And so we will move on. All right. So the next clip, uh, this is a, uh, uh, this is the uh, season one, episode seven. This is a, um, will be a very common theme, especially around the high holidays uh, after we see this uh, next clip. So let it roll. Thank you for gathering everyone. I wanna keep you all updated. Here's what we know. Someone slaughtered Janet. Oh boy. Oh boy. I assume that this horrifying act is somehow related to the other issues we've had here. It also means that the problems in this neighborhood are not 100% my fault. There is something else at work here. If anyone has any information about any of this, I beg you, tell me. I love you, ma'am. Michael, the problem in the neighborhood is me. I was brought to the good place by mistake. I'm not supposed to be here. So she she fesses up to her mistakes to the the wrongdoing that uh that led to all of the chaos in the neighborhood and it, it begins the what i believe is she starts looking for forgiveness so um Gitty, i'll start with you this time uh we think of high holidays we think of yom kippur we th is forgiveness what uh, does go does it go beyond the high holidays? What was beautiful to me about that clip is teshuva in Hebrew. When we say teshuva, some people think of it as repentance, but the Hebrew root root word is actually shuv, which means return. And like Eleanor is this say it like it is character. She doesn't, you know, she's not fake. She might not be ethical in when she steals things, but she's not fake. And so the concept of teshuva returning, like she's returning to her best self when she uses that character trait of being blunt and truthful and she gets up and she says, it's me. And I, you know, to sh it, this is such a big component in our service. We're all, like we're talking about tikkun and we're talking about brokenness. We're all broken in different ways. We all have different holes in our soul. And teshuva is the way God allows us to change the dance, constantly be improving ourselves, doing better. It's like getting a redo. And I don't, that was just a beautiful moment for me in that show. I think that's like, that's when she starts doing her pivot and reinventing herself. But I do just wanna comment a little bit about when we were talking about the angels 
from how I understand it, angels are these spiritual robots and they don't have much free choice. And I think the next one maybe is about free choice. The next clip, correct me if I'm wrong, Lonnie. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll get into that conversation about free choice, but the, and you know, they don't depict anyone in the show. They're all in human body suits. The, the, not, the non-living humans and the demons and Janet, everybody's in this human body suit, but from how, we un from how I've learned about angels is they have much less free choice than the human being. And these concepts that we're talking about, the interpersonal, the, the between humans and God, Teshuba, these are concepts that are much more in the here and now of the this world. I don't know how much we believe in change and transformation after um, when we're just a soul and not a body soul combination. From how I understand it, our, the body soul combination is what allows us to have free choice because we have these dichotomous energies that are conflicting. The soul is purely spiritual. It's this part of God. It was breathed into us by God. And then we have these physical bodies that say that loudly want to be taken care of all day. And that push and pull is what allows us to have free choice. So that's so what I free We'll get back to free choice. Right, and we're going to get um, to free choice with the next clip. Absolutely. Uh, Rabbi Glazer, how about you on, uh, on uh, Teshuva in this clip? I'm Obviously, for it. I'm for Teshuva. <laughs> I am, I am pro Teshuva. I'd be out of a job if I weren't. Um, obviously, as, as Gitti pointed out uh, at, at appropriately, um, uh, forgiveness is paramount in Judaism. Um, what, what's an interesting, what was interesting to me in contemplating this question, somebody else on there, um, is, that, is that most of the characters most, most of the characters seem unaware that they have truly sinned. Um, as Giddy pointed out, uh, um, Eleanor is one of the few who actually um, seems to know who she is. Um, uh, victim, victimless crimes, as she says in one, in one segment. Um, you know, later we find out that Tahani says that she raised $60 million for a charity, but then it's pointed out that she did it for questionable reasons to get back at her sister and all that. Um, the, the Yom Kippur, the only other thing I wanted to say about this is the, I thought it was interesting also in a beautiful moment when Eleanor gets up and, and fesses up that it was her who did it. And it does bring sort of a, a Yom Kippur uh, analogy to mind, except for one significant difference, and that is that when we confess, uh, when we say al lefanecha, we do it as a community. There's nobody who ever gets up in a shul, at least none of the shuls I've ministered to, who gets up and says, "For the sin I did, I want to, I want to publicly state it right now." We all get it get up as a community to do it. So while Eleanor is taking the whole blame, um, on the one hand, we, we see that heaven and hell are filled with people who make it that place because of how they behave. Um, and I heard one person once say that the reason that we, that we confess our sins in the plural is because um, we learn our behavior, our bad, our ill behavior, but from other people. So it's very fitting that we should uh, own up to that which we have done wrong in the past year in the context, in the, in the uh, you know, along with our, our co-sinners. Um, anyway, so that's what I got about it from that. Yeah. I didn't hear, did you, did you ask for me? Yeah, how about you on? Uh, yeah, sure, uh, on, so just, uh, just briefly. Just briefly, uh, the uh, the davening in the plural goes back to and speaks to that uh, central idea of community and and being bound to each other and responsible for each other. But uh, you know, I'm reminded of a mission in Pirkei Avot that says that we're supposed to do tshuva um, the day before we die. 
and uh, that is to say, kind of clean the slate, um, repair relationships uh, if you haven't done so, at least before you die. And then the Mishnah says, well, how do you know when you're going to die? Therefore, be sure to do it today. We don't have to wait until Yom Kippur to uh, work to repair our, uh, ourselves and repair our relationships. We can start now. So now we're going to jump to season three. Now, a lot of what season two focuses on is the do-overs. Um, the, we have the big revelation at the end of season one. Michael, much to the sh uh, Michael secretly, you know, does his own, um, you know, breaks the own, the his the uh, the rules of the bad place and keeps starting over the his uh, his village his town um, over and over and over again, even though he wasn't supposed to because he was trying to get it right. So there's a lot of do overs there, but we jump to season three in episode seven and Gitti sort of set this clip up. Um, uh, with the uh, the idea of uh, free will and do we have control over our own actions? So, Genevieve, fire away. Just determinism. What? Determinism is the theory that we have no control over our own actions. Everything we do happens because of some external force which exists outside of our control. I didn't choose to fall in love with Chidi because some all-knowing demon, you, brought us together and scripted our lives. That's ridiculous. I didn't make you kiss Chidi by that lake. Githy, I'll let you sort of run with this one a little bit since you sort of teed it up earlier. Uh, determinism as uh, a Jewish concept? <laughs> okay, so this, this one I think is really tough for a lot of people to understand because we are limited by time. So we see things in order because time is a big deal for us. <laughs> and I think a lot of people want to know, if I have free choice, if I get to choose, am I going to eat healthy food, unhealthy food? But God knows what I'm going to choose. How do I have free choice if God knows? And so these concepts, it's, do you realize what we have done? We have brought up some of the most deep and controversial and important topics and trying to squish it all into this hour and a half Zoom, class, Zoom session. But, so we're just kind of touching on this, but basically from how my limited understanding is that God is not limited by time. So God can see everything all spread out, unlike us, who we see things in a linear way. So yes, we really do have free choice, even if God knows what we're going to choose. And free choice is what makes us, is, is what it's really all about, what these 120 years of body-soul combination are all about. We're constantly getting to choose on so many different levels. We get to choose our attitude. We get to choose how we react to our loved ones. We, like, that's where it, it's, it's all living in our free choice. And it's, and I think one of the wacky things for me about it is how constant it is. Constant, constant, constant. How every single second we have to keep making good choices. Just because we made a good choice one minute doesn't mean that we're safe and okay. Because the challenges keep rolling our way. And I'm just blown away by this day after day because I struggle on many levels. <laughs> oh, yeah, listen, the, the rate at which chips are going away in my house right now because my, my office, if you will, is very chips. close to the kitchen. No, chips and every other food item in the house. But Rabbi Davis, do you agree that God knows what, whether you're going to make the right choice or the bad choice before you make it? Yeah, I mean, the, uh, this is a 
classic uh, paradox, uh, again, back to Pirkei Avot that teaches Hakot Safui Barshut Mituna, that uh, all is foreseen and yet free will is, uh, is given. And uh, you know, but so at the end, uh, in the final analysis, Judaism is actually okay with something contradictory. We say these and these are the words of the living God. Like it, we're not gonna resolve that uh, contradiction, but it is a uh, free choice that is at the heart of the Torah and it's at the heart of being, uh, being human. Um, the Torah tells us, behold, I place before you blessing and curse. Choose, you know, make a choice, right? And, and it encourages us, choose blessing, choose, uh, choose life. Um, so were we to not have a uh, choice, we will, then we'd be uh, robots. Yeah, uh, you know, in, in in that that clip was one of my favorite clips um, uh, of the entire show. Not only that, you know, the extended the extended conversation goes in the library, and then either it continues in the in the coffee shop, or it's preceded by I can't remember, but it's a very deep conversation between the two of them, where he is continually uh, Michael is continually rebooting Eleanor. And she realizes, or seems to realize, that everything she has done or become has been as a result of a puppet master pulling the strings, I think are, are her words, a puppet master. Um, and this is, a, 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 as Rabbi Davis mentioned, this is a serious theological question that has been put to uh, many different ways um, over time. Um, the question is, is anything we do a result of free will, or does the all-encompassing divine have it mapped out for us already. Um, another way to put it, and I'll just bring in another reference here, not having anything to do with the show, is if any of you all have been reading these books by Yuval Noah Harari, Sapiens and Homo Deus, in the book Homo Deus, he asserts that uh, we are simply flesh and blood algorithms that are respond. In, in other words, everything we do, not unlike a computer, are responding to the input, to circumstances that, that have been programmed by our experiences, uh, our DNA, our parenting, uh, that nobody ever makes a real free will decision. And actually Eleanor in the show actually makes this co uh, comment when she's consulting the philosophy book in the clip you showed, right? And then in the coffee shop, right? Um, do you, when Jess, do you want coffee? And she goes, well, what do you mean, do I want coffee? Do I want anything? To, do I have any kind of option here? Whatever biogenetic factors led me to this? And she goes on a whole rampage of that, right? So, and so I thought that that was, was pretty cool. Um, but Michael disagrees, right? He says, I tried to script your, your afterlife, but you made choices I did not see coming. And then when, when Eleanor finally suggests that, that Michael himself may be subject to a greater demon's authority, which I thought was a very cool moment, uh, and that this authority might also be subject to a, a authority on top of him. He stops, and what does he do? I don't know if anybody remembers. He dumps ice water. He dumps his iced tea on her head. And that struck me because I often, when talking to kids about free will, I'll hold something like that. I'll hold a vase in my hand and say, do you have any idea what I'm going to do with this right now? And I said, neither do I. And then I either hold it in my hand and place it down or I drop it just as a way of saying, yes, we have agency. And it's a very important concept Judaically, because if there is no free will or choice, that would render our holiest document, the Torah, moot. We would not need to be commanded to do right or to enter into a covenantal relationship with God. You know, it says in the Torah, choose, uvacharta b'chaim, you know, choose life, right? Why bother commanding mitzvot if we are, in fact, robots? I think it's, it's, it's fairly safe to say in Judaism, we very much believe in the will of people and the need for people to learn how to behave with their free will. Uh, thank you, Rabbi. Uh, uh, Suzanne uh, Shalom asks, uh, Yuval Harari, who you mentioned, is Israeli? But an he atheist, is. is that correct? He is. He's he's uh, he's he's not about God. No, he's, uh, he's no, he's not. He's not into 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 God, except in so far as he believes people have manufactured a God. Um, and that, but that's not the most troubling thing about his books. When you read them, the most troubling thing he says, and that kind of violates what we're doing here tonight. He doesn't believe there's a soul, 
He doesn't believe in the existence of a soul. He believes that human beings, as I said, are just flesh and blood algorithms that are playing out the determinism that, that, has, that has been running through our bloodstream ever since birth. And then with our parents behaving the way they did and our, you know, that everything is programmed and that there is no such thing as choice or free will. But that's a dangerous idea, I think. It very. I think it's a very dangerous idea. Um, all right. So a couple people in the chat have talked about how it ends. And so we're going to, uh, this is the point in the discussion where we, uh, we, we talk a little bit of season, uh, season four and a bit how the show wraps up. So I don't want you to leave, but if you want to be surprised, you may want to maybe sit this one out, mute it, walk away for like five, 10 minutes, cover your ears, close your eyes, whatever you need to do. Uh, so I will, uh, Jen, queue up the next clip. the ocean. You now you can see it, measure it, its height, the way that sunlight refracts when it passes through, and it's there, and you can see it, you know what it is, it's a wave. And then it crashes on the shore, and it's gone. But the water is still there. The wave was just a a different way for the water to be for a little while. There's one conception of death for a Buddhist. The wave returns to the ocean where it came from and where it's supposed to be. Not bad, Buddhists. Not bad. <laughs> None of this is bad. Love that, that whole scene, the way, I mean, for so many things where, how it's shot, how, you know, the whole bit. Um, but uh, Rabbi Davis, I'm gonna start with you on this one. Um, obviously, Chidi's talking about Buddhists and how they're sort of, uh, conception and or the act of dying is how how do we look at it yeah so uh it's a beautiful uh image uh, that i find incredibly uh powerful um the idea of the wave dissolving back uh into the water um it's actually not so dissimilar in that sense of what we say we say um Adam in Adama, that we are humans of the earth and we return, you know, to the earth when we uh, do a burial. We bury people traditionally in a plain pine box so that literally their remains return to the earth from which uh, they originally came. And this idea, you know, uh, that, uh, um, uh, that they say that, uh, you know, it, it's not bad, he says, it's really, it's really not so bad. Um, likewise, you know, I think about uh, this beautiful teaching um, that when God looked out after each day of creation, God saw and it was good. Day two, God beheld and it was good. And uh, by the, uh, the sixth day, the last time God saw it and behold, it was very good. And the rabbis say, well, what was so good about it? What was it that was good? And Rabbi Mayer says, death. That's a really bizarre answer. What, what, we don't think about death being good at all in, in, in any way, shape, uh, or form. But I think similarly to the conclusion of uh, the show, that is, um, by having an end, it makes all the time before that that much more precious. For were we to live forever, forever, it actually wouldn't be good, which is what they, uh, they discover. Um, Worse than uh, than dying is never really living. Laser. Oh, me. 
Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I love, love this uh, um, wave returns to the ocean. It's, it's, it's beautiful. I've heard it before. And it, it very much reminded me of, of another Kabbalistic uh, tenant, which is, I think, important for this show. And that is that, that what, we, what we learn is that the soul ascends through worlds of increasing holiness until, they are, until the soul is one with God. It begins in the corporeal world that we live in, in Malchut, Asiya, it's called. Uh, that's our nefesh. So the nefesh is the, is the soul that is, um, that is encased in, in, the, in the flesh and blood jacket, as it were, right? The animal soul. Um, and then after we die, we're, ta we're taught that the ruach hovers for the 11 months of mourning um, before it's actually admitted up a step, right? Why 11 months? Why not a full year? Um, as one of you pointed out when we were discussing this uh, a few days ago, um, it's because the soul has to gain its own admittance to the higher realm of neshama and then on to the ultimate uh, uh, realm. And this is what Chidi is sort of alluding to, I think, is the Jewish version of it, is that there's a, there's a level of soul that's called yechida. And we never hear this word, right? We hear neshama, nefesh, ruach, but we never hear about the, the soul called Yechida. And the reason we don't is because that's when the soul reaches oneness with God. Um, it comes from the word Yachad, Yechida, Yachad, which means to be virtually indistinguishable from the Ein Sof, to go back to one's creator. Uh, as Chidi said, we are back in part of the ocean whence we originally came. And the Yechida doesn't happen until the end of days, we're taught. You know, the end of days scenario, uh, the rebuilding of the temple, the coming of the, the heralding of the Messiah, etc. That's when that will happen. And that's what we hold out hopes for, that ultimately we will rejoin our, our maker. there. I think that Lonnie's cutting out a bit. Gizzy, why don't you unmute and share with us your thoughts? There you go, Gizzy. Um, yeah, I thought Rabbi David, when, when Chidi was explaining the water version, I thought that's, that's what we say about Earth. And I'll go personal here, because I don't have much to add after you, after you wise rabbi spoke. Um, just, I used to be really private about this, but I changed my opinion. I have been working on the Chevra Kadisha for the past, I think about three years. And th this is, um, a group of people who help get other people deceased ready for their Jewish burial. And we look at death, like in Judaism, we look at the, as death, as the body and soul just separating from each other. And we try to help facilitate this separation in the most peaceful pleasant way possible. And the whole process of getting someone ready for their Jewish burial is just giving the body that ultimate respect because it was the house for the soul all those years. And that it's, I think Judaism looks at death as this temporary goodbye to the body, but that the soul is living on, like Rabbi Glazer was saying, for these, all these different stages of eternity into that final, back to the original, the final reunion back to the source of where it originated from, and that was Hashem, God. And the reason, at first when I was, um, joined the Chabra Kadisha, I just wanted it to be private, and then I realized how many Jewish people maybe thought it was kinder to the earth or themselves to be cremated. And then 
I just decided to change my approach and talk about these end of life issues because from how we understand it, the, the reuniting the body with the earth is very helpful for the, the process of the separating of the body and the soul and those 11 original, those first 11 months where there's this parting happening. So it's been very um, centering for me. When I participate, I always come home with this greater appreciation for life being this finite gift. And it helps ground me in what's important. Our bodies are these temporary, temporary houses for our souls. And I, I'm certainly one who gets too wrapped up in the voice of the body. So I find this gra grounding. I'm off topic, but I'm very good at that. Since you brought it up, um, I know several people who have been involved in Hyper Kadisha before and have spoken very highly of it as well. So it is lovely to hear you say such things about it. Um, uh, we do have, before we go to the last clip, we have a question um, from Jenny who, who had asked if there is uh, free will or, you know, if there is a, you know, a choice or free will, what do you say to a child who is challenging with questions about why is he Jewish? And, and why does he have to be Jewish or can't be whatever religion his friends are? Who wants to take a stab at that one? Pretty heavy question. <laughs> yeah, it's a difficult question. Uh, it's it's uh, um, in, in the context of free will, uh, sure. Uh, I mean, yes, a any one of us has the choice um, to, uh, uh, to decide what uh, faith and what community we want to be a part of. Um, from a, the perspective of a parent and an educator, um, our job is to uh, raise children, giving them um, a thick Jewish identity and experience um, to make them, uh, to encourage them to find the beauty um, and the meaning in, uh, in Judaism. And Likewise, as a parent and as an educator, we would not, I think, be well served to allow our children um, uh, to uh, make a major life uh, decision um, without our, uh, our guidance. I mean, as a rabbi, I don't work with, um, you know, if a 15-year-old if or a 14-year-old uh, came and said they wanted to convert to Judaism, I would say we can start studying now, but we're not going to go through it. You're you're really too young. It's not. It's something uh, that can only that, that requires a greater maturity. Get to you, Rabbi Glazer. Either of you want to take a stab at it? No, I thought that I was pretty like... good. Oh, go for it. Oh, I was going to say, should we be respectful? of the time frame we gave for the other participants and possibly follow up with this question after? I was gonna give one quick, that's fine. We can, uh, we've got the last clip queued up. Uh, it is, we jump back to season three in the 12th episode and we'll wrap our, uh, our journey on, on this clip and discussion. So go ahead. I guess all I can do is embrace the pandemonium. Find happiness in the unique insanity of being here. Now, we'll do this together. In the words of the man that I love, I got you, dog. Thanks, Janet. <laughs> you know, for a robot, you'd make a really good girlfriend. I'm one out of three of those things, but thank you. Good luck. The pandemonium and the journey and 
um, that was, uh, and doing it together, that those feel Jewish to me. Like, you know, it's the, it also feels, you know, just sort of human. It's the, you know, the, the, it's the journey, not the destination, you know, that, that old cliche. What, uh, is there, is there a, you know, Jewish, uh, chestnut in, uh, in that clip? I see Rabbi Davis nodding. Yeah, uh, you know, I think about um, this song we, we were talking about singing earlier, so I'll sing for you a song that all, many of us know, but we don't necessarily think about the words. We say sim and tov and mazel tov, mazel tov, yehei lanu, yehei lanu, ulecho Yisrael. We say sim tov, we, we sing in celebration, right, at a simcha, at a joyous occasion, and we say lanu ulecho Yisrael. It is for us and for the entire Jewish people. That is, we find our happiness, as we heard in that clip, uh, to, in togetherness. That's part of what makes this time period, this pandemonium that we're living through so incredibly difficult is that we really can be together on Zoom um, virtually, but we can't be together together. Um, it's uh, therefore no surprise that the very first time that the Torah uses the word low, um, it's not good after all of these descriptions of it is good, it is good, is when the Torah says, uh, when God says to Adam, Lo topayot Adam levado, it's not good to be alone. That we find happiness and we find goodness in being together. You want to follow up on that? We missed who the direct uh, the question was directed towards. Didn't hear who you. Well, Rabbi Glazer, go ahead. Oh, okay. Um, you know, I, this one actually was, was harder for me, so I don't have a lot to, to, to say about pandemonium and finding happiness in the journey, but I was, I was drawn into a, a comment that, that is made at least once or twice in the, I think it's the first season, um, where I think Eleanor says, the bad place didn't pick the worst people. It picked the worst the people who were worst for us. And again, that, that led me to believe that, that it was, that it, that's the, it's the neat, at least in the writers of the show's imagination, it's, it's the role of the relationships that happen in that afterlife, that event, that, that are, that are the, um, the agents that, that, that make their souls evolve through, through the series that they're placed there in order for them to grow and become something. And in the Kabbalistic sense, to ascend, I would imagine, to a higher level of, of being. Um, but I also, when I thought about this, thought about the, the, the old adage that, that, that heaven and hell are, are states of mind. They're really what we make of it. When we were discussing this a little while earlier, I was okay with you guys. I'll just tell this really quick story. This is a classic Jewish story of a, of a guy who... Um, who is who is who dies and he's told that he's going to have a choice he's going to get the choice of whether he wants to be up there or down there and he goes really I have a choice is yes but you might want to take the tour first and he takes the tour and they go down and they arrive at a banquet hall and it's a huge banquet hall and they come in and the people walk in and they're gaunt and they're hungry and they look famished and tired and he notices to his horror that even though the banquet table is filled with food there each person has a long like a yard long um, uh, uh, fork and knife attached to their hands. So when they dig into the meal and try to get it into their mouth, they, they throw the food all over the, the room and they leave as hungry as they were when they came in. So he says, well, that certainly is hellish. Can I see the other place? He takes them to the other place. They walk into the identical ballroom, the identical banquet room, and the same people come in and they take seats at the table. And when the, when the command is given to eat, they dig in with those same yard long utensils and they turn around and they feed each other. And that's why they're not starving in heaven and why they are starving in hell. And I, I love that story. I don't tell it a lot, but I, I love that story because it really, it teaches me the importance of, of doing what we do and, and, Growing a soul, as one of my Kabbalah students likes to say, grow your soul now because this is your opportunity. I think he said this before. This is the playground. This is the testing chamber. This is where we, we, 
we make the, the soul that will eventually die and go to another place. But this is where the work happens. And I think it's a very Jewish concept and a very important concept for all of us to, uh, to embrace. Story, Rabbi. I, 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 but it really does tie so nicely together with the show. Uh, it was really great. Gitty, last word on this one. The pandemonium and pandemic share the root word, because like <laughs> like rep <laughs> so yes yeah, they like, do and panentheism. <laughs> it, um, yeah, back to what Rabbi Glazer just said about this is the playground. I guess the pandemonium, we're each given the perfect pandemonium to perfectly grow our soul here in lots of different factors, our socioeconomic status, our spouses, our children, our families of origin, all different, all different factors. One of my mentors likes to say, either you marry your homework or you give birth to it. <laughs> and some special people get both. So, <laughs> so yeah, I thought when she said that, when Eleanor said, you know, I guess it's the key is finding the happiness in the pandemonium. It's, we get to choose, we get to choose our attitudes and we're creating our realities. And this, these quarantines are very, the good thing about them is we're still alive. So we can still work on these relationships. But the, if someone would have told us months ago, like, you don't have to get dressed, you don't have to go to work. You can just like kind of like partially work from home. Shh, don't tell my boss that. Um, um, for some of us, we might have thought, oh my gosh, that sounds amazing. But then when it actually happens and we have to spend way more hours with the people in our lives, we're like, that's not so amazing. And we've, you know, it is what we've created these relationships to be. And the good news is, is we are still growing and changing, but it's pandemonium and humbling and lots of growth, soul growth opportunities. Uh, well, we are coming right up on the time. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for joining us who chimed in with questions, who watched, who enthusiastically watched the show, um, to Rabbis Glazer and Davis, to Gitty. Uh, thank you to my coworkers who are manning the controls, Genevieve. Genevieve and Libby, who, nice work, both of you. Thank you so much. Uh, we appreciate it. Uh, and everybody, have a great night. Thank you. Thanks for Thank you, everybody. Us. Okay, take care. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Such a fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. Thank you. I appreciated being here. <laughs>